You mean I have to live out the rest of my life in this body? No fucking way! You got me into this, you get me out. I can't do that, Chucky. Why not? Because you're an abomination. An outrage against nature! You perverted everything I've taught you and used it for evil, and you have to be stopped! That's Chucky from, I don't know, one of the Chucky movies. And he's consulting with the voodoo doctor that got him into this mess in the first place. Of course, this is more movie fantasy. But again, is it? For anyone who's really studied magic very much, like today's awesome guest, Richard Smoley, the lines can get rather blurry. You reference black magic. That's going to be immediately. That's where everyone goes. Well, I think uh, there is a certain reality to it. Irish taxi driver in Honolulu, who uh, got involved with a native Hawaiian girl, and the mother really did not like this at all. She told him to hold off, but he didn't, and he suddenly started to become subject to paralysis from the feet up little by little by little by little. So uh, then someone who was familiar with these things said, you know, I think there might be some uh, magic involved here. Let me go and talk to this mother. Mother said, mm, I don't know. Maybe there is, maybe not. But um, I think that maybe if he gets on the next boat to the mainland, things will be all right. And, you know, that evening, this cab driver was right and took the next boat to San Francisco. And speaking of blurry lines... What happens when we apply that same sensibility to oh, Christianity? Is Jesus an egregore? No, I think Jesus was a historical figure. And Is Christ consciousness an egregore? Because Jesus as a historical figure is kind of a cop-out. I mean, Bart Ehrman, who is essentially an atheist, thinks Jesus is a historical figure too. He was some wandering guy who went around and said a couple of things. You almost come to the point of saying that in the in the book, The Truth About Magic, you say the Christian gods can best be understood as an egregore, the Tibetan Buddhists call it a tulpa. I wouldn't say so. This is a great level three chat with a truly remarkable researcher and knowledgeable guy. I gave him a pretty hard time, but I have the ultimate respect for Richard. Let's get right to the interview to Skeptica, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. Today, we welcome Richard Smoley to Skeptico. Richard, of course, is a Harvard and Oxford trained scholar in religion and philosophy, and a recognized expert on all sorts of stuff related to Christian mysticism, Gnosticism, theosophy, and all other kinds of stuff that we like to talk about here on Skeptico. Richard has a new book out, The Truth About Magic, which I'm sure we'll talk quite a bit about, but I'm hoping we can also get him to talk about some of his other research and some of his other work, particularly one that I've referenced before on this show and in my book, How God Became God, what scholars are really saying about God and the Bible. An excellent book from a guy who, again, is recognized among religious scholars as somebody that really needs to be paid attention to, even if he a lot of times steps outside of the bounds of normal kind of academic religious scholarship, which is much needed. I mean, you don't want to stay in those boundaries because there's not much happening there. Um, it's just something we should really talk about because it's something I've dealt with on this show. And it's part of the reason I was drawn to Richard in the first place is kind of getting this understanding of who we can really rely on, how we should sort through all this important information about spirituality and the religiosity that's associated with it. So there is a lot to unpack here. I hope we can get to all of it. I might piss Richard off and this could end early, uh, but I, I am going to risk going to 
uh, some of those other places because they are of my interest and I'm really not interested in a coast to coast kind of canned questions kind of thing. I do want to say, because we might get into some of that stuff, that I have a tremendous amount of respect for Richard Smoley, for his work, for his deep spirituality that he is both wrestling with, you can tell, in a very dynamic and important way, and is also communicating effectively with people who are equally trying to find their way on the spiritual path. So, with all that, Richard, I know you, you kind of probably don't know what's coming now. So, well, welcome. Thanks for joining me. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and um, I very much look forward to it. And um, go ahead. Feel free to piss me off. You know, if we're not pissing each other off, at least a little bit, I mean, we don't want to piss each other off all the time, but if you're not risking doing that, then I feel like you're not really fully engaging the dialogue, especially on a topic that is as uh, controversial as the stuff we're going to talk about today. Because let's go back and talk about your current book, your latest book, I should say, The Truth About Magic. Tell us a little bit about that book and, uh, you know, the usual stuff, why you wrote it, who it's for, and, you know, brief overview. Well, I wrote this book in two days, and uh, it's part of a larger project. Uh, G&D Media, the publisher of the book, uh, had me do an audio, visual, video, simultaneous recording over two days, which was a year ago, almost exactly, and then I edited the transcript. So this is uh, an edited transcript of basically me speaking, and I think this is good because it forced me to keep things as simple and clear and concise as possible. And that is what this book and what the audio uh, video series is about. It's an attempt to introduce people to this whole world of alternate realities, including magic, the occult, uh, and many other things, psychic powers, many other things that they've been wondering about, but never have really felt they've had kind of an entry point into. And that's what this book is about. Okay, because, you know, for folks who are listening to this show that pick up this book, there's definitely some nuggets in there that are, are really quite profound and well-written. You're a fantastic writer. We all know that. But I think a lot of people are going to struggle with where you're coming from in terms of this introduction, who you're speaking to. I mean, when, when we talk about the occult, when we talk about uh, magic, most of us now are thinking about magic in modern day culture, you know, uh, Damien Eccles and high magic and celebrity magic. And I pulled up musicians who've actually practiced magic and Netflix magic. I mean, we are obsessed in our culture with magic, but it's not as, I don't know, kind of dumbed down as it is in this book. I, I, I just wonder, aren't most folks way past this magic is real stuff? Well, let me put it this way. I read something a few days ago that said that the average American has a seventh grade reading level. So although there are many Kanyashenti, lots of edgy artists, magician types out there, I know some of them, uh, this is not really for them because they know all this stuff already. This is for people who haven't got a clue. It's, it's for the, the, type, the very sophisticated edgy types you're talking about may be interested in some of it, from what I have to say, from my own point of view. But I'm hoping they'd also be interested in it and saying, well, look, I, my cousin uh, doesn't know anything about this stuff. And where do I start? Well, you could hand them this book and at least give them a handle on it. So this is not, this is not kind of written for the Kanyashenti, for the people who already know a great deal about it. It's written for the average Joe. And I think that is um, much needed. Okay, but if we're really to jump right in the middle of that, I mean, 
you know, is Damian Eccles from the West Memphis Three, are you on board with his understanding of magic, his Aleister Crowley, do what thou wilt, you know, here's how to compel the spirits to do your bidding kind of stuff. I mean, here's a guy who was convicted of raping and killing three kids in Arkansas, convicted and never, you know, I mean, there, there's there's a whole bunch of kind of bad stuff to keep it really simple, whether we'll leave the evil term out of it, that is associated with people who are going down the magic path without thinking super deeply about it. So I, I, I'm just not sure. I, I want you to clarify when you say they already know. What does what does Damian Eccles know? I don't think he knows shit. I think he's really missed the point about what the spiritual path is. And the fact that he's wrapped it in this word called magic and uh, is, is troubling to me. And I think we need to, to sort that out in a way that is beyond kind of seventh grade reading stuff. Well, do you have any similar concerns or you? what do you think? Well, in the first place, let me, let me state right out in front that I have never up until this moment heard of Damian Eccles. Uh, what you just, so what you say about his work uh, is all I know about it. Uh, I can make certain uh, conclusions about it uh, just from you know some of the, the things you said, like Crowley, Thelma, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. So that is, that is part uh, one section of magic. Uh, I think one thing that needs to be pointed out is that when you take something like this, you are encompassing an enormous moral spectrum, as well as a spectrum of practice, as well as a, sp uh, um, a spectrum of theory. Let's take uh, two other areas with huge spectrums. Let's take religion. Um, religion has uh, often uh, pointed humanity toward some of its highest uh, goals and highest achievements particularly artistic achievements, if you think about it. And yet it's responsible for all sorts of crimes and um, uh, mishaps and um, lies. And then let's take another discourse, which is science. Yeah, science created the COVID vaccine, but on the other hand, uh, a lot of the environmental problems that uh, we're dealing with now are, are part of the scientific, and the result of the scientific worldview. So to say, well, any of these is, they got part of this, is that not, that's not really science, that's not really religion. Well, in a way, that's special pleading. So there are all sorts of things that go on in magic, from the best to the worst. And that only means that magic is uh, very, very much a human phenomenon. Well, is it? I mean, that's kind of the point of your book is that it's it's really not. And that in the way that we've normally limited our understanding of human endeavors, and in particular, the way science and atheistic science, which is by design, uh, this has kind of been my thing is that, you know, the science meme that you are a biological robot in a meaningless universe, that you couldn't possibly have any understanding of anything beyond your five senses is a very deliberate attempt to kind of control this ability that we have to reach these extended realms that you're talking about in the book. So I guess first I'd want to drive that stake in the ground. What do you think about that? Yeah, well, we're witnessing the collapse of the scientific worldview now because it's come afoul of uh, its, its own internal uh, uh, confusions and contradictions, because many of which are implicit in what you just said. Because on the one hand, uh, it's all a question of what we can perceive through our five senses, enhanced by electron microscopes, the Hubble you know, uh, spacecraft, whatever, but nonetheless, it's still a matter of our five senses, okay? Now, on the other hand, science is also telling us that these five senses are highly limited, highly conditioned, perceiving only a very small part of what actually may be out there. 
as shown first by the fact that uh, scientific theories and results are becoming more and more anomalous in terms of um, you know, uh, common sense uh, thought. Uh, in the second place, well, you have, uh, I believe it's Donald Hoffman, um, somewhere in your vicinity at the UC Irvine, who's saying, well, our senses evolved really just to be able to function and you know, uh, decide whether the animal is going to kill you or uh, you're going to kill the animal. And it excludes a whole bandwidth of things because they're not relevant to our survival. So you cannot then argue that this is very, very limited view and that at the same time as the scientific worldview pretends to do, that's telling us everything, even everything that's knowable. Another point in fact is uh, science has limited itself to five senses as conventionally known. And yet somehow all over the decades, all over the centuries, all over the world, all sorts of different cultures, people have real perceptions that um, do not accord with the five senses as conventionally understood. Oh, by the way, uh, I'm sure you've dealt, well, I know whom you've interviewed, so you've certainly dealt with this. Um, there's certainly a number of researchers who say, well, you know, actually science has proven the existence of psychic phenomena, at least to a certain degree. So all of this makes this whole scientific worldview cave in on itself. And I think we're witnessing that today um, it may even have disastrous consequences. Now, I did not say that we are wish witnessing the collapse of the scientific method, because the scientific method, as a method uh, narrowly focused, um, is a legitimate one. On the other hand, its conclusions can never be final. You know, Sir Karl Popper said, uh, if you think you've come up with final results in science, you've given up the game. Yeah, so let's kind of uh, stay with the science thing for just a minute. I hear you, what you're saying, Donald Hoffman, I think he's terrific. He's been on the show, one of my favorite guests. And the limiting through the five senses, got it. And in terms of science's ability or inability to measure, which is what science is really all about, is measuring and comparing. And when it acknowledges that it doesn't have the means to fully measure then it's kind of obsoleted itself. Uh, another way that it obsoleted itself is really a hundred years ago in the whole quantum theory, Max Planck, you can't get behind consciousness. Consciousness is fundamental, a double slit experiment, which I think, you know, one of the most ex important experiments of our modern time is the one done by Dean Radin, where he took the double slit experiment and said, well, let's, take it to its natural conclusion. Let's put a highly skilled meditator in there and I'll generate a photon beam through my little photon beam generator and my little photon beam collector. And I'll ask him to interfere with the photon beam. And consistently, you know, six sigma result. If you know science, that's off the charts statistically. He was able to do that and show that. And that's replicated throughout many labs, many replications of that experiment. Nobel prize winning stuff never get one. But the, the point being that now we're saying, and you were nodding your head, so I know you're totally down with this and you talk about this in the book. As soon as we introduce consciousness into the equation, our conventional science as we know it model is obsoleted because now every experiment needs to have a little asterisk next to it, which says, we did the best we can in measuring this, guys, but we really couldn't measure consciousness. So we just kind of left that out of the equation. Well, how big is that asterisk? So, but let me unravel that. Because the question I really, I guess I was asking Richard is, are we to believe that that is an accident? That science's insistence that we are not these rich spiritual beings who are on a spiritual journey. Science's insistence that we are nothing more than biological robots in a meaningless universe. Are we to assume that that's just accidental, that those guys just like, gosh darn it, that's the best we could figure out. I don't think it is. I, I think it's by design. I think it's a social engineering project because people who are of that mindset are easier to control. Yeah, well, there are a lot of reasons for this. And one reason is 
that historically science and religion have been bitter enemies and remain so. Uh, very soon as when science was born in the 17th century, uh, the churches and churches got very, very nervous about this and either tried to poo poo it, deny it, or sit, set its limits uh, very, very narrowly. I think with science, again, if science, I, the science scientific worldview, the worldview that you've just described is, I believe, obsolete. The scientific method as a method of inquiry uh, will remain useful as long as anyone wants to use it. So I, I do uh, distinguish very strongly between those things. And there is something, as you know, called logical positivism, which is obsolete, except maybe it's not so obsolete, which says that no statement that cannot be scientifically verified is either true or meaningful. Well, in its pure form, that didn't last much more than a decade. But the logical positive mindset stays with us to this decade. So science is simply, in my view, science does what it does, but it steps beyond its bounds by saying no other method of knowledge. And I say knowledge, I'd not say faith, because faith, as you know, is basically a bullshit word. Uh, other methods of knowledge are totally invalid. And that is where I think science is overstepping its bounds. Okay, I'm going to try one more time. If I was interested in controlling the world, and somebody has to control the world, that is our, the, the evidence is clear. I mean, we try, the United States tries to control the world. We are an empire. That is our goal. That is, there's a self-preservation part of that. But that is why we fight wars. That is why we undermine other governments. That is why we spy. That is why we do all this stuff, because we're trying to control the outcome. And as part of doing that, it's become clear, especially in our lifetime, both of us are old enough to see that there are many social engineering projects that just are later revealed as being true. The one I always is my touchstone because half people know it and half people don't, but, you know, Gloria Steinem. And so, and the reason I bring that up is not to talk about the women's movement, but I, I just get tired. I just had an interview yesterday with the Bruce Grayson, the, you know, just eminently excellent near-death experience researcher. And I, I kind of wound up going in kind of the same territory is, do you really think this stuff isn't controlled? Why wouldn't this stuff be controlled? Why wouldn't someone have an interest in where culture goes? So the tie back again to Gloria Steinem is, you know, we can argue about how involved she was, but how about why the hell does the CIA care about the women's movement in which direction it goes? Why do they care about the LSD movement? Why are they deeply involved in that? Because they're deeply involved in social engineering and control. And as soon as we accept that, why do we think they're not playing that game in science? Of course they are. Well, there was a lot what you said. One, I didn't know that fact about Gloria Steinem. I knew she had been a Playboy bunny, so maybe the CIA was trying to uh, get her to infiltrate the Playboy club and uh, 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 undermine Hugh Hefner's Playboy philosophy. Well, I think you're being sarcastic there, but but I mean, you, you, yes, it's almost like so. you got to pause and do the Google re do the Google search. <laughs> see or say she was CIA, and I don't know if it's like a sixty minutes interview, but it was like of that level. And then go back and look at why she even came out and admitted it is because somebody outed her, somebody in the women's movement outed her, and then go look at why they outed her. And then you have memos from her CIA boss saying that. So, you know, and this is kind of the thing I pinged you on a little bit with the book. It's like, there's some history here that I feel like we have to kind of, again, drive a stake in the ground and say, okay, did that happen or did that not happen? because we're gonna build a lot of implications on top of that, that if we don't ground ourselves in that, you know. Well, I certainly think uh, historical research uh, and, there, and has certain validity. I am not uh, a postmodernist or a deconstructionist or a conspiracy theorist that says this is all lies. 
I will refer you, in fact, to the only the most factual book I've read about the CIA, which is called Legacy of Ashes. And if you read this book, Legacy of Ashes, and I've forgotten the author's name, the history of the CIA is one continuous uh, uh, legacy of bumbling. Whatever they did, they did wrong. They they blew the Bay of Pigs. They they blew the the North the Korean War. They um, well in the Iraq War started partly because Cheney knew how bad the, the CIA was, and for his own personal reasons, just chose to disbelieve them. And they said, "No, I don't think there's any weapons of mass destruction." So my point here is, uh, I uh, I guess I better not apply to the CIA for a job anytime soon. But my my point is. You're right, there's all of this control. You're right, all of it. But what is the net effect of all of this control? Because no one entity has enough control to enforce it uh, worldwide. Conspiracy theorists like to believe uh, there are, but they don't really have very good grounds for thinking so. It's more like there's a conspiracy of a large number of powerful competing interests whose interests dovetail sometimes, sometimes very much um, conflict. And this, uh, what, what would that uh, produce? Chaos, or at least some measure of chaos. What do we see in society, the world today? Some measure of chaos. Well, I tell you what, let me try and pull us back on course a little bit, but mm -hmm. hopefully with a bridge that, that connects. Because my real point just is that I think we have to look with a skeptical view towards these memes that are passed on. And the one is the scientific meme that, you know, we already covered that. I'm not so sure that that's an authentic, organic meme. I'm not so sure that materialism is going to fall or is collapsing. I don't believe that because I think the evidence where I was really going, Richard, is you want evidence that materialism is insufficient explanation for reality as we experience it. Well, we had it 100 years ago, right? So Schrodinger and Max Planck and all those guys, they were mystics, right? They said, hey, sorry, but this is where our experiments have led us to. Consciousness is fundamental. You can't get behind consciousness. They did the double slit experiment and they said, what this implies is, you know, if a tree falls in the forest, well, if no one's there, there you know, none of it happens because consciousness is fundamental. And that has been taken out of the equation, I think by design, but I said, we're gonna get back to your world. I recently interviewed a guy, this is back to your world. And this is back to, to the book, but also your work in general. So I interviewed a terrific guy, uh, Dr. Hugh Urban, religious scholar, Ohio State University, esteemed university, respected scholar, wrote a book on Scientology, right? And if you're in academia in religious studies, you can't call Scientology a cult, even though we all know it's a cult, you have to call it a new religious movement. And we understand the limitations of that because if you really look at Christianity, it's hard not to call it a cult. If you really look at just about every religion, it has cultish aspects that you'd be hard pressed to, to kind of differentiate how those are different from Scientology. But at a kind of basic street level, we do understand that Scientology is more of a cult. The point is that he traced back the history of L. Ron Hubbard and Jack Parsons, L. Ron Hubbard being the founder of Scientology, and Jack Parsons being the founder of Jet Propulsion Labs, and uh, both those guys were a number one students of Aleister Crowley and in constant communication about Aleister Crowley, about the workings and the magical rituals and sex magic rituals that they were doing. And in fact, back to our friend, Dr. Hugh Urban at Ohio State, he says, yes, I can verify that they were out in the desert in Nevada, doing the Whore of Babylon ritual in order to bring forth the Antichrist. And they were doing that under the direction of Crowley again. And I said, okay, well, doesn't that trouble you at least a little bit, Dr. Urban? And he said, no. He said, I've seen a lot of stuff. He says, it really doesn't matter if it's true, if there's any reality to it. 
It only matters what they believe. So this is the kind of uh, uh, postmodernist, I can't deal with extended consciousness. I can't deal with magic. I can't deal with anything spiritual. So I, I, again, to me, it is a direct result of that scientific mindset that's instilled. And, and of course I push back and go, well, that's kind of ridiculous. I mean, the first thing that we have to know is, is there any chance that this is real? Are there extended realms? Can we compel entities that might exist in those other realms to do our bidding? Until we can answer that question, we really can't uh, deal with that history. We can't just say, oh, it doesn't matter if it's real or not. And that, I think, is the state of what we're calling religious studies these days. Uh, do you agree with that assessment of where that, uh, that a lot of that thinking is at? And do you see that as problematic relative to what you're trying to bring forth with, with this book and your other books? Well, there's certainly a lot, David. Hey, let me insert a commercial. This is called The Dice Game of Shiva, How Consciousness Creates the Universe. This is a book I came out with in 2009. So I guess I'm also saying that it all comes back to consciousness. Uh, that much said, uh, religious studies, uh, Yes, I, I was just sending an email today about a uh, book uh, in religious studies published by none other than Princeton University Press to someone I said, well, I think this woman missed the point. And I think most of it misses the point. Although very likely, as Hugh Urban says, yes, uh, Jack Parsons and Crowley probably corresponded at X time in Y place and so on, all of that is, uh, legitimate, it doesn't take us very far. And it doesn't take us very far in the direction I think you want to look into. I would say simply that if you are going to be genuinely empirical, genuinely empirical, you have to take the whole of human experience into account not just the five senses and not just the five senses as focused on um, the typical repeatable experiment. Uh, and the, ex the experience of humanity uh, is full of exactly what you're talking about. And it, throughout all cultures, throughout all uh, places, times, the only exception is ours. And that could well be because we've had it hammered into our head for the last 150 years that it's nonsense. So, so if you're going to be genuinely empirical and genuinely consider all the evidence, that is the evidence of human experience, you have to bring this religious experience into it. Now, that doesn't mean you have to believe every last little thing everybody said. In fact, examining this religious experience, this paranormal experience, requires as much or more skepticism, but genuine skepticism. I mean, I don't know exactly how you think of the word skepticism or skeptic. But at this point, I don't think of skeptic in what I believe it's an original sense. And I don't think it's used in its original sense. That is to say, I really want to know. I don't know yet, but I do want to know. The skeptic today, and when someone says I'm a skeptic, they're basically saying, yeah, I know this is all bunk, when they know nothing of the kind. So uh, if you really want to uh, you have to take this into account and you can't just write it off and say, well, it's all imagination. It's all just illusion. It's all, oh, here by, here's another little one. It's all anecdotal. It's all anecdotal. Yeah. Yeah. The whole human history of the history of the human race is anecdotal. You're not going to repeat the battle of the water, battle of water, fortunately. So yeah, as long, you know, uh, yeah, you have to be skeptical, genuinely wishing to know, genuinely incorporating all of this as well as scientific findings into some kind of worldview. Now, has our civilization done that yet? No, it has made every step to do the exact opposite, to divide everything up and exclude all sorts of things. And what would that result in? Confusion, dissociation uh, on a mass level, anxiety, depression, willingness uh, to believe all sorts of absolute rubbish. That's what we have. Okay, let me, let me kind of, uh go back to Hugh Urban. I see a real problem in the soft sciences. 
I see a problem in the hard sciences in their insistence on materialism, which, as I said, I think is at least influenced by a, a social engineering meme that likes to see things go that way. In the social sciences, I think the way that has kind of manifested itself is this kind of postmodernism, as you said, you know, relativism. Well, nothing can really be true or understood. You know, I just I interviewed a guy, well, we'll get into that in a minute, Gregory Shushan, uh, who's done a cross-cultural analysis of near-death experiences. And I will interject this story because it's really important. I think his work is super important. So again, when you go cross-culture over time, this is the benefit of our audience, it's the best way to kind of weed out the social the social construct part of something, you know, uh, is this just something we've cooked up in our own kooky culture or does it extend beyond time into other cultures? So Gregory Shushan does some very important work and says, let's look at near-death experience. Let's look at that across cultures, across time. And he finds, aha, I'm finding consistent threads. And he's trying to explain to me his methodology. And he says, it's difficult work to do, because you're dealing with different accounts. Some of them are firsthand accounts. Well, all of them are secondhand accounts, but some of them are like thirdhand accounts. A guy told me that a guy told me kind of thing. He says, but through that, you know, you can still put together some good information. And then he kind of said, I'm paraphrasing, he said, until you talk to other people in academia who say, we can't rely on any accounts of anyone who ever lived because it's all polluted by, this is the kind of the ultimate postmodern, it's all polluted by culture, it's all through this lens of, you know, culture, 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 which is contrived, and it's, you know, some microaggression, individual versus, but this is real dialogue that they have among academics, and when I look at religious studies as a whole, I just go, this is just gobbledygook. Who is listening to any of this as being real? And I guess I'd return to the other question. Do you think they're, are they for real? Are they really, who are they speaking to? Who's listening to any of that stuff? I agree with uh, the researcher insofar as I um, know about what you said about near-death experiences. I mean, I've certainly read enough about them. I have not had one per se. Yeah. But uh, yes, there. I, I, I mean, my wife is watching the Netflix series on this right now, and you know, I'm not really that interested in it because you know I've read so many of these cases; and they all sound the same, which validates them, but it doesn't make it for very fascinating watching. Uh, so that kind of uh, dialogue of the of the man you discussed with academics, uh, you know, hard academics, uh, is I think very legitimate and very powerful. I, I'm not really going to attempt to defend conventional religious studies in academe. Um, I don't have a PhD because I didn't want one, because I didn't want to become a professor. And the older I get, the gladder I am I didn't, because I realize what an intellectual trap that is. And besides, particularly if you want to like get tenure or retain some kind of, you know, uh, there's a lot you just can't say. It's like the Inquisition, except you don't get burned at the stake. So no, I, 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 I wouldn't defend that stuff at all. And I think the kind of research that you're talking about and the kind of dialogue that you're talking about, well, of course, no two people are ever going to agree on everything or sometimes even anything, but I think it's, it's a perfectly legitimate. I, you know, I'm glad this kind of thing is happening. Uh, and all I can say is there's a lot further to go. Yeah, you know, um, we're going to stay on a uh... Dr. Gregory Shushan for a minute. First off, he is, I guess, in some respects, maybe a, a living example of what you feared, right? So he's gone down the academic route. He's been starved, basically. I mean, they toss him a little something here or there with some affiliation to do some things. He's a brilliant guy. But, you know, once you put on those, as you were saying, those academic handcuffs, you're really kind of stuck. You can't, find it. You never figure out another way to earn a living. So you're always going, going back and kissing the hand. But the other interesting thing, the super interesting thing, the most important thing about his, his research is he comes to the conclusion, and it's pretty radical 
but he really backs it up, is that virtually every religion has developed their beliefs about the afterlife from near-death experiences. And he has some amazing accounts. And one of the things that he did that was really smart about his research, he looked at uh, primarily indigenous cultures. So, you know, leaving Christianity and other uh, mainstream religions off the table, but then bring them in at the end and saying, there's no reason to believe that they would be any different. So he goes and looks at all these different religious traditions and Native American traditions and oceanic traditions and just all over the world throughout history. And he says invariably, and there's even documentation among those accounts where the shaman will say, oh, you know what? Richard just had a near-death experience. That sounds real. We need to change our beliefs because they really did go to the other side. They really did bring back some information. And then those become the beliefs and they become part of the religion. Yeah, well, I am, again, not familiar with Dr. Shoshan's work, except as you've described it. Just uh, a superficial response is, that uh, makes a great deal of sense. I think I would be a little more cautious about saying that all religious theory, all religious uh, teaching comes from near-death experiences. Just, just uh, to clarify, certain, he, it, he said they're afterlife beliefs. After, oh, afterlife beliefs. Well, even so, but I, I, I think you could argue about whether it's it's 100% that or a very significant part of that, but it certainly seems basically plausible. Uh, another thing that is, is of course, uh, even more problematic is visits from the dead. It's very common for people to have visits from recently deceased family members, often in a way that is, well, cannot be written off entirely as imagination or wishful thinking. I used to edit a magazine called Gnosis, and we would get sheafs of these things in. We didn't publish this stuff. It wasn't the kind of thing we published it. Uh, I would you know, send them back with a polite note, uh, but they were sending us because they didn't know who to send it else to send it to. Uh, most of these people aren't going to tell their families and friends, because if you start talking about that, your family and friends become your worst enemies. Yeah, oh, yeah, you, bullshit. You didn't believe that. You know, you know, that you know, all that business. Um, in any case, um, I think what he says is uh, what you say of his work uh, sounds uh, very plausible. As far as my own work goes, I am a writer. I have various day jobs uh, doing various things, including writing. Uh, and that gives me an enormous amount of freedom. I'm sorry. Uh, it, 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 it enables me to um, write and say anything I want because I don't belong to a church. I don't need to uh, care about uh, a tenure or an academic position that I never wanted anyway. Um, I can say what I want and people are free to take it at face value. This is what I say. You can agree with 73% uh, of it and disagree with the other 27%. Uh, you know, I think it gives me a great deal of freedom, at least to be reasonable, intellectually honest about where I'm coming from, which freedom I would not, I believe have in the um, in, in the university. Okay, Richard, let me try and come back to the book on a couple of points that I, I think are interesting that everyone is interested in. You reference black magic. That's going to be immediately that's where everyone goes. Can I do people really can they cast a spell? It's a fear based thing, you know, might I be the victim of magic? And you kind of say both you kind of say, well, you don't need to worry about it too much, but the best you can tell from your research is there is a reality to that. Do you want to speak about that at all? Well, I think uh, there is a certain reality to it. Uh, one case that comes to mind is, um, and this happened a number of decades ago, was this um, taxi driver in Honolulu, was Irish taxi driver in Honolulu, who uh, got involved with a native Hawaiian girl. And the mother really did not like this at all. And, you know, she told him to hold off, but he didn't. And he suddenly started to become subject to paralysis from the feet up. 
little by little by little by little. So uh, then someone who was familiar with these things said, you know, I think there might be some uh, magic involved here. Let me go and talk to this mother. And I said, mm, I don't know, maybe there is, maybe not. But um, I think that maybe if he gets on the next boat to the mainland, things will be all right. And, you know, that evening, this cab driver was right and took the next boat to San Francisco. An interesting thing about this, if you take the story, let's say the story is true, uh, and there are others like it. Uh, one is this cab driver didn't believe in any of this stuff, right? Two, he didn't know it was happening. So you can't say uh, it's all suggestion. It's all playing on someone's credulity. If they don't believe in something in the first place and they don't know that it's happening. In fact, you know, I, not to throw out a pointer that um, may be misused, but if you're casting a spell on someone, you don't want them to know about it because they can take countermeasures. So this, um, I say, takes it a little bit out of the realm of the nocebo effect, you know, uh, believing something will harm you and it will. Uh, so I think there's something in there. Um, I think it's possible to become, uh, particularly if you're uh, uh, psychologically weak, to get very much afraid of this and uh, in a way to almost uh, bring it upon yourself, whether by imagination or where, whether you're letting something in. So I think, I think there is something to it. Uh, you know, and of course, it's always uh, discouraged, uh, largely because it usually backfires on the practitioner, eventually at any rate. Someone once said, um, there are no old black magicians, they just look old. So I think there, I think this, this sort of thing does happen. Um, the reason I'm being uh, perhaps a bit almost equivocal about it is that when, when someone buy, starts buying into this, they start buying into, a, you know, a Hollywood version of it. And of course, because our uh, life imitates art, all of those people you just, you've just shown are basically doing that. Hey, you know, th this is, let, let's, let's be the Hollywood occultists that we've seen about in all these movies. Hey, that sounds like fun. Um, so I think all of those elements have to be factored into it. And this is not to say that every uh, attempt at this kind of thing is uh, real or valid or has any consequences but I'm willing to admit the possibility that some do. See, Richard, this is the point though. That is the launching point. That's the beginning. And, and, and I feel like you're kind of leaving, you're, you're just gonna bring us to that point and say, that's the end of it. I mean, take, take any one of those uh, little tidbits that you left hanging there. Is there a reality to it? It certainly seems like there is. From an anthropological standpoint, people have gone to other cultures, studied voodoo, studied curses, studied shamanistic practices throughout the world that do this. And consistently, as you're alluding to, they come back, at least the ones who are honest about it, and say it's pretty undeniable that there seems to be uh, witnessed accounts of this. People who are disinterested parties witnessed it, all the rest of that. So it, so that's one tidbit that we just can't leave hanging out there. We then need to say, how would we begin to investigate that? How would we understand that? How would we understand how to wrestle with that in our lives? And then equally with the, the, the celebrity magic, you know, and you mentioned the, the Hollywood thing, and I was not only talking about you know, Damien Eccles, but musicians who we all know have talked for a long time about, you know, selling their soul to the devil in order to gain certain powers. But I, we cannot just take that stuff and just dismiss it because we're kind of given, we're kind of given two different versions of it by our culture. Uh, one part of our culture, the scientific culture, just denies that any of that could possibly be true by edict. They just say, don't pay any attention to it. It can't possibly tr be true. But there's a whole other part. If you go to Netflix and if you go to just popular culture and you look at celebrities, there's a wink and a nod. Well, of course, this is true. Of course, this is how the universe really works. And let me tell you how to marshal these entities for your benefit. And why the hell wouldn't you? If you can get the spirits on your side, I, I, I love your point about there are no 
old black magicians they just look at, but give me the scientific evidence for that. Are, are we at the point where we maybe need to start taking this stuff seriously and start applying some real research into understanding what's going on? Well, I guess my response to that is, okay, design an experiment that would satisfy you. I think you'd have a bit of difficulty doing it. Um, and oh, by the way, this stuff is not quite like stuffing makeup down the rat's throat until you figure out how much it takes to kill him. Because frankly, it doesn't matter whether the scientist is a good mood or bad mood or whatever, if he's stuffing this makeup down the rat's throat, the rat will die with a certain amount of makeup in its gut, you know, on some statistical basis. Um, but in this stuff, <laughs> the, the, the mental, uh, because you're dealing in, shall we say, mental realities, the mental um, state of the investigator has an enormous amount to do with it. So I mean, even more than in um, a, a, a quantum um, experiment, the, the, the Dean Radin uh, thing is uh, just what well, experiment is uh, certainly an example, but any of, uh, it, what are you gonna do? Go to a, a magical ritual and, you know, well, what findings did you uh, determine? On? I suppose you could. Well, you know, um, Radin, but Radin is doing that. I don't know if you've seen his latest book, but his latest book is, a magic book. Real it's a magic book about magic, magic. It's about bringing magic into the lab. And I, I, I appreciate where he's going. I don't know that he'll really get there, but, and I interviewed him about that, but why not? Uh, you know, he's saying if this is a aspect of nature and we need to understand more broadly, kind of what you're saying beyond the five senses, why wouldn't we try and apply the scientific method to it? I commend him for at least opening himself up to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I do too. And uh, if he can develop experiments that test this kind of thing and um, knowing him maybe a little bit and knowing his work a little bit, I have no reason to doubt that he could. Um, I'm, I'm all for it. Uh, and let's find out what he uh, discovers. It's not that it's um, off limits. As again, again, it's certainly not like oh, it's a matter of faith. It's just simply, okay, go there if you can. Uh, nobody, in my humble view, is ever going to get to the end, if only for Karl Popper's reason. You know, <laughs> you know, you think you've got final results, you've just given up the game. So it's, it's legitimate. I support it. Um, I, of course, like everybody else, know only a tiny fraction of what's going on in this work. But I don't see any problem with it. Um, I'd be interested to see their conclusions. Um, so uh, that's certainly fine with me. No, I, I, I agree. And, and I also agree those limitations. I, I respect because he does such careful work anyway. But I also respect just the effort, the saying, OK, I realize it's the kind of post-materialism science that says, OK, I realize the game's up. I realize we can't really measure everything. But with those limitations now acknowledged, what can we seem to understand? So I'm going to bring one other guy into the equation. I'm sure you haven't heard of this guy, but he's fantastic. He's just been so influential to me as I ran across him because I've been, I was doing a series of shows on evil and on things that we all kind of acknowledge, you know, horrible crimes that people are doing against children or stuff that we can all point to and say, ah, in this great discussion of, is there such a thing as evil? Is there such a thing as a moral imperative? Well, at least we can say, yeah, that to me probably does go in that direction. So I'm doing these shows and a clinical psychologist from Grand Rapids, Michigan named Tom Zinzer, Dr. Tom Zinzer, and practiced for a long time, says, Alex, you don't really understand the difference between evil and darkness. And he goes on to tell me that in his practice, he had pretty broad practice, worked with a lot of different people, did a lot of hypnotherapy in his work, kind of along the normal lines, you know, I'm afraid of spiders, I'm afraid of water, but then had also gotten into work with people who had been victims of uh, satanic ritual abuse, which if anyone has any doubts is very, very real. 
I don't know about the satanic part of that because we really don't know what that word means. And we can reference your excellent book, How God Became God. And you can see that historically, if you go looking for Satan, he kind of slips through your fingers. But if you just stick to the theme of the satanic perversion, do harm to other people, hey, that pops up a lot through culture throughout time. And uh, I'll, maybe I'll pause right there and let you speak to that. Yeah, well, I think uh, uh, in terms of the world we know it, there is such a thing as evil. In fact, I will say categorically about you, although I know nothing about you, I will say this categorically about every person who listens to this or ever listened to this, you have known some good in, in your life and some evil. Uh, the proportions vary wildly, but uh, you both, you know what good and evil is through experience. And this goes back to the book of Genesis, which um, although a myth in one sense is profoundly true in another, the human race wanted to know good and evil. So here we are, uh, you got what you wanted and you get to experience both, no matter how rich and lucky you are or how poor and miserable you are. So there is that. Um, I don't know, that's, that's, that's kind of what I have to say to that. So, you know. Okay, maybe, evil. maybe then Richard, can I pull you back into, because you do a beautiful job of this in pull you back to your other book or one of your other books, written many books, How God Became God, where you really trace back this story of the devil as he pops up and how he kind of changes over time in order to advance the story or to advance where they want to take the story in terms of the religion. Do you have any, any thoughts on that? Do you want to share any of that? Well, I'll pull together some thoughts, not, not uh, so much from that, but from the truth about magic. Uh, I am willing to say that contrary to scientific theory or not, there is such a thing as thought forms. That is to say, thoughts have a certain substance in the world of what the Kabbalists call Yetzirah, the world of forms. You experience it in dreams, fantasies, so on. And if a certain thought form is uh, given energy through focus, uh, either uh, revered or uh, feared, as someone once, I think it was uh, Andrew Carnegie who put it that way, uh, it will have a kind of objective existence. It is a human creation. It's a collective human creation. Uh, but because it's had so much energy poured into it, uh, it, it has a certain quasi-independent, at least, flavor of um, existence. So do I believe in the devil in the personal form? No, I think there is this devil. And, and this collective thought form has a word in the world of magic. It's called an egregore collective thought form. It's what I, I just said. Satan, uh, the devil, is an egregore. This entity, this thought that has an enormous amount of power, and you can, you can, yeah, you can tap into it if you want. Is Jesus an egregore? No, I think Jesus was a historical figure. And is Christ I, consciousness an egregore? Because Jesus as a historical figure is kind of a cop-out. I mean, Bart Ehrman, who is essentially an atheist, thinks Jesus is a historical figure too. He was some wandering guy who went around and said a couple of things. I mean, I, I, I just, you almost come to the point of saying that in the, in the book, The Truth About Magic, you say the Christian gods can best be understood as an egregore, the Tibetan Buddhists call it a tulpa. I am down with that. I think we are co-creators of our reality, you know, but if you really want to go there, I mean, you're going to piss a lot of people off, but it wouldn't, wouldn't a lot of Christ consciousness, which is definitely real people experience it when they have a near death experience. Wouldn't a lot of that be best understood as a collective thought form? I wouldn't say so, but there's obviously no under obligation to agree with me. Um, as I said, really in many of my books, if you peel back uh, your experience, you get back to some pure witnessing I, capital I. 
and the Hindus call this Atman. Uh, the Christians call it um, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God or I am. And that is not uh, an egregore because that is fundamentally what we are. Uh, and it is consciousness because, as I said, conscious creates, conscious creates the universe. So no, I don't think those things are egregores. Now, that much said, uh, a lot of energy has been given into this, to this image of Jesus, this image of God, and all of those things are. God, for example, I believe in God, if you uh, want an answer to that question, but I also believe that God is far beyond our conceptions of him. Nevertheless, being humans, we're bound to form some conception of him. Well, it would be, is it a human form? Of course it is, because we're humans. As Xenophany said, if horses had God, they make them look like horses. That's kind of necessary part of our experience. And I think, frankly, we have to, shall we say, honor that part of it while realizing that it's not the absolute truth. While thinking, when you think these images of yours are the real thing, you become um, an idolater. And that's what idolatry is. You think some image is the thing it's represented, really. Whether that's a statue, uh, a doctrine, um, uh, the image on a stained glass you see in church. So I think it's, it's, it's a little different, but I hope that casts some light on what I think. I've really been interested in near-death experience. I have a, probably a hundred shows on it because I think in a lot of ways, I don't think it's like perfect, but it does kind of cut through a lot of the cultural filtering and other just personal egoic filtering that we apply to the spiritual experience. At least that's what it seems. It seems kind of a little more authentic. I've interviewed a number of Christians about their near-death experience, and I've gotten varied responses. Ian McCormick is a guy who came on, and you know, there's Christians like Ian who are attempting to kind of co-op the near-death experience, even though that's not what the data suggests, and say, hey, if you didn't see Jesus like I did, man, you didn't have a near-death experience. That was Satan messing with you on the other side. And I've also interviewed um, other folks who have had a near-death experience and, and have encountered what they understand to be Christ consciousness in a very direct way, and, uh, and, and they report that consistently. And researchers in near-death experience have, can tell you statistically how many people do. So I'm wondering yeah. when you say, what, what differentiations are you making? How do you understand the historical Jesus as different than this kind of co-creation that is Christ consciousness? Because, or, or do you even, I'm jumping in there. Do you believe that when people encounter Christ consciousness through a near-death experience, or maybe through another spiritually transformative experience, what do you think they're experiencing? I am not going to be lured into the trap of saying what other people did or didn't experience. Uh, and uh, I, too many times you hear, oh, you couldn't experience that. That was your imagination. I'm not going to fall into that trap. I'm not going to say where these people did experience Christ consciousness or not, because I don't know, because I didn't have their experience. But I will say this. It does seem that these near-death experiences, the entities and realities encountered uh, in them, tend to reflect the belief system of the individual. That is why this man says, he, you know, hey man, if you didn't see Jesus, you, you just weren't there. It's also why you read the Tibetan Book of the Dead, and all of these forms have the forms of the, of the, the Tibetan gods. Why? Because that's their conceptual structure. You have an experience and you fit it into your own conceptual structure. Now, that's as true uh, of day to day mundane experience as it is in the near death uh, realms. Uh, because, yeah, I have a computer in front of me. I'm fitting it into my conceptual structure. If I had a different context, um, um, context, I would you know, not know what it was for, think it was a work of the evil one or you know, something like that. So I think the those experiences can be genuine. They are gonna be clothed in the, shall we say, visual language you can best understand and are most familiar with, usually. Yeah, I guess where I was going is, how does that relate for you to the historical Jesus? Most Christians 
believe that Jesus is special, different, unique, that that time period is special, different, unique, that the moment when he was crucified or when, particularly when he was resurrected is a particular turning point in history. Do you see any evidence of that from your research? Well, I don't know what evidence from research, but as I say in this book, Theology of Love, I think it is at least possible that the historical Jesus reached a level of Christ consciousness that is rare and is therefore um, perhaps more enlightened than we are and may even be able to help us from other realms. I'm not sure I would say anything very different about uh, the Buddha. Uh, so do I think Christianity is exclusively or uniquely true? No, I don't. I think Jesus probably had this level of very high consciousness. And because one is, because what in, is in oneself is deathless, as I said to you before, um, yeah, he, he probably can manifest. Uh, and what connection does it have with a person with Jesus? I don't know. Um, I can't really say. Uh, a lot of the book I just uh, uh, held up is based on A Course in Miracles, which is allegedly channeled from Jesus. Now, do I know that this was channeled from Jesus? No. Did the woman who was channeled through know whether it was from Jesus? No. She, she, it's, I don't know. I don't know who it's from, but it does have its own peculiar authority, and I have to pay attention to it. So, you know, it's uh, the, the thing is, maybe the essential point in all this is we're being called on in so many instances to say, do you believe or not believe? And this is the Christian, this is the Christian mentality. Uh, and it's uh, been transferred to the scientific mentality and all sorts of mentalities. Uh, but no, I don't particularly have to believe. Um, I'm willing to consider a lot of possibilities. I mean, one important esoteric maxim I learned was neither accept nor reject. This gives you an enormous amount of freedom to say, well, it may be so, phenomenologically, it looks so, uh, but I don't have to, um, you know, sign, uh, you know, the Augsburg Confession uh, in regard to it. I think an open-minded inquiry, uh, the possibility that one may well be wrong, the possibility that everyone else may be wrong too, are all uh, points of view that really need to be you know, maintained when one um, delves into these areas. And, and let me just kind of uh, bring this back from the brink before I push it back to the brink, which I'm about to do in a minute. But th this book that we're talking about is in many respects, extremely practical for a bunch of people. Even myself, I found comfort in your kind of even handed approach toward and practical approach towards Hey, don't believe everything, but don't disbelieve everything either. And just pointing people towards areas that they might want to investigate further. And in that respect, I think the book does a great job and it is very conversational. It's easy to get through and it's easy to bounce through some chapters and say, hey, what about the tarot? What is that all about? And there's some good historical information, a little bit of debunking on some misunderstandings and then some practical information. Same for astrology, same for after death spirits, all that stuff. So uh, there's for many of us, even folks who feel like they've been on this path of spiritual investigation, I think they will find little nuggets in this book that they're going to find very helpful. Has that been has that been your experience? What kind of feedback have you gotten? Yeah, I've gotten feedback like that. Uh, in fact, I sent a copy of uh, the book to um, one of my oldest and closest friends who's very much not a believer in this sort of thing. And he, he said he enjoyed it and um, read out some passages to his sister and, you know, got something out of it himself. So I am getting feedback like that, and, which is good because it's exactly what I intended. And um, I just want to say something. I mean, I, when I'm speaking in this book, I'm speaking from my own personal authority in the sense that this is what I have to say. This is not what the church says. This is not what uh, the, the, the lodges of Thelema say. This is not what um, the uh, you know, department of whatever at whatever university says. This is what I have to say. What does that put on you? Well, you're equally free to accept or reject it, or perhaps both or neither, on your own authority. And um, 
there is a strange verse in the New Testament where it said, the crowd wondered at Jesus because he spoke as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now, what's, what's very interesting about that is if you pay attention to it, that would have to mean that the people in themselves, whoever they were, had some inner capacity to recognize real authority versus some guy who's blabbering on a chat and, and, uh, verse. That means you have your own authority and that has to be your ultimate touchstone. Agree with what I say, don't agree with me, say like me, don't like me, it doesn't matter. You know, I think you really have to bring that back to this and also admitting the possibility that um, uh, I might not be right or I might change my mind tomorrow. You know, that's new information may need lead to new conclusions. You know, so, and I think that's what true skepticism is about. It's a desire to really know, uh, to be honest about what you don't know, and you know, always being willing to say, well, I can always know more. Uh, I'm never going to know everything because I don't think that's possible uh, in a human existence. But there's always another direction to go and further to go. And that's one of the main points of my book. Excellent. So Richard, uh, one more point, if I can, and then I'll, I'll let you go. You've been very generous with your time here. But I want to return to my little story about my buddy Tom Zinzer, again, the psychologist, clinical psychologist from Grand Rapids. And he starts encountering these people who have experienced satanic ritual abuse. And as you know, that's a very uh, controversial topic for a lot of folks but it really shouldn't be any little bit of investigation of that that's honest and fair. You will find that for whatever reason, there's people who are engaging that activity and it's extremely harmful to the victims. And I've interviewed at least one of the victims here, uh, Annika Lucas, who was involved with the Dutro case in Belgium, which kind of made national news, you know, back in the 90s when it happened. So these things are very real. And they're always countered with kind of a disinformation thing like satanic panic, which I guess is real in a way too. But there is a fundamental truth to it. So it wasn't just panic, it might have been exaggerated by fundamentalist Christians who took it too far but there was a, a real truth to it. So this is what Tom Zinzer found. So he's working with patients and he's finding out that they really have been traumatized, sexually abused in a lot of cases at very young ages. But what he finds that's particularly important and interesting for our discussion is the incidence of disassociative identity disorder. And that that may be actually a mechanism, a tool to engage with the extended realms and that these practices of uh, doing things to people in order to create this dissociative identity disorder might actually be a tool. Well, lo and behold, go look at MK Ultra, and you'll find exactly that that's what they were engaged in. They were intentionally trying to do that. Go interview Whitley Strieber like I did. You'll find that that's what they were engaging in. There does seem to be a mechanism almost a science to reaching these extended realms through disassociative identity disorder. Is that anything you've stumbled across? And do you have any thoughts on that? No, it's an idea I've never heard, although it's an interesting one. Um, it makes a certain amount of sense on the face of it, having just heard it. But I want to go back, because you screened through an enormous number of satanic figures uh, a, a few moments ago. And these people are all over the place. I like, got uh, Anton Zandor LaVey, uh, who's, well, I, I can't point to him, but you, you see him here somewhere. Um, yeah. Uh, let's know, show the he, picture of let's show the picture of him and uh, Michael Aquino. That's that's my go to guy who they were yeah. big buddies. And well, Aquino, if you look at the evidence of him, I mean, he's a pedophile and the evidence of him and his wife abusing kids. And I, I pulled that up on the screen in case we wanted to talk about it. Search warrant. I, yeah, I, house. I don't I don't know. I don't know about his particular case. I mean, I. Uh, I mean, he was a colonel in the U.S. Army intelligence, which, you know, oh my God. But on the other hand, 
Um, he was a Satanist. I guess that's he the was... kind of person uh, you may want uh, who knows how to do this stuff. Or, um, uh, well, he LeVay, was publicly not... he was publicly a Satanist, though. I mean, right? So yeah. he was a member. He, he stayed in the the military and said, "Hey, I'm freedom of religion. I'm a Satanist. Mm -hmm. You know, this is what I do. This is how I practice." And uh, so, yeah. Well, I, I do know other uh, people who call themselves Satanists who seem on the face of it to be, you know, actually really quite decent and ethical people. So, um, you know, Satanism is this band. Where there are really people doing this. You know how you know how you know that there is the satanic ritual abuse going on. Definitely, be, because you have to apply the principle. Um, if you can think of it, somebody's tried it. That is basically probably the epitaph of the human race. Yeah, if you thought of it, somebody's tried this. Uh, the epitaph, the real epitaph of the human race is probably, it seemed like a good idea at the time, but um, we can uh, bypass that. So yeah, I think this thing exists, but uh, I would be very cautious about saying everyone who kind of seems to fit the label of you know, the, the temple of set or the left-hand path as they sometimes call it is doing these kinds of things. I do believe people are doing these things. Uh, in the name of Satan. On the other hand, uh, in terms of just sheer statistics, uh, how many uh, people are doing this in the name of Jesus Christ in Catholic churches? I, I mean, in numerically, uh, which group is larger? Go down the list of churches. Uh, you know, LDS churches, uh, you, you, you mentioned Catholic churches. You can go to all the other strange groups that now have come out the same thing. So yeah, um, and cults, cults as well, including all the 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 ones, including Indian cults and all the rest of them. So no, I, I get your point. I, I get your yeah. point on that. It, it's it's really more of a, and that's why I wish you would have gone more in the book because the way I see it is there's certain energies that people are tapping into, and that's what my buddy Tom Zinzer said, he said, look, there is darkness and darkness is like a gravitational force. It's not bad per se. It's just the relief through which we see lightness, but through we see light and that light is really the game. Light is what it's about. And you would agree with this because that's what your book is about. It's about achieving oneness with the good, with God, with the moral imperative to do right, which we all know what's the right thing to do. But Darkness is always there and available to us, and it doesn't mean that it's evil. Our acts of being drawn to the darkness in order to satisfy our problems is what evil is. This is what Dr. Zinzer told me, and it makes a lot of sense. It would also make sense in terms of, hey, the satanic people, the serial killers who are claiming a uh, connection to spirit entities, same thing. They're just trying to tap into something that relieves them of the feelings that they have because they feel the dark force and they don't know how to get to the light force. There was a good sermon, but do you have anything to say about it? <laughs> well, one of the chapters of my book is called The Life Force, and which is sometimes called chi or prana. And what is it? It's, well, for one thing, it's the difference between a living human being and a corpse, which are, as you know, otherwise anatomically identical, at least at the outset. Um, and this life force is morally neutral. I mean, that is one of the, the appeal of the Star Wars series, because the Star Wars actually series talks about the force. And it, it, the force is morally neutral. There is the light side of the force and there's the dark side of the force. You can use electricity or nuclear power for the most benign and helpful means. You can use them for the most um, um, perfidious means. So, you know, then, you know, why you choose one or the other, well, then that gets into a very, very complicated uh, moral questions. But um, yeah, I, I, that's what I have to say about it. Well, excellent. I, I think the torture session. <laughs> you know, it has been torture. It's been an awesome dialogue. And I appreciate your openness. I mean, you didn't back off of any questions or anything like that, which I, and, and it's fun to engage in these kind of dialogues that take us beyond what we normally talk about. So this book that people are going to want to check out, The Truth About Magic is out now on Kindle. 
Richard's many other books are available as well. And you'll find just some great stuff in there from somebody who truly is a, a spiritual seeker that we want to keep in touch with. So Richard, thanks so much for joining me. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and just uh, to reinforce one point that might not uh, be already clear, I want to say it was a pleasure from beginning to end. Oh, fantastic. Thank you, Richard. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you so much. Thanks for your interest in my work. Thanks again to Richard Smoley for joining me today on Skeptico. The one question I'd have to tee up from this interview, isn't this why evil matters? How are we ever going to get to that next level of understanding of this stuff if we can't get past level one? Okay, that's a total inside baseball kind of question, but if you're still with me, you're probably playing inside baseball with me, so jump in there with an answer. Plenty of places to do it. Track me down however you see fit. Until next time, take care and bye for now.